is a um, hello welcome to walk in the park my name is Tony Ingram and this is July 25th 2018 this is episode 199 you can see all of my episodes if you go to my website walkinthepark.tv that is a URL walkinthepark.tv see all 180, 199 when I get this one up this will be showing on uh, public access TV in Ithaca New York channel 13 and this is produced at uh, Pegasus studio in Ithaca and you can go see all of our series uh, and their schedules at pegasus.webstarts.com that's our website and uh, you can also find out how to become a producer yourself this is community media and anybody in the town of Ithaca, the city of Ithaca, and also outlying areas if they um, pay for a fee, pay a fee, but those are participating communities, Ithaca and town of Ithaca, um, to uh, get training to become a producer, get uh, you know, certification, you can use the studio, you can borrow equipment and take it out and uh, shoot, come back and uh, produce your own shows like I've been doing for quite a few years now. We do have a Facebook page. Check that out. Um, see what's going on there. So uh, walk, in the, walk in the park. Um, we're going to go to some parks, as we always do. Let's see. Um, first one we're going to go to is Buttermilk Falls. Okay. It's been really rainy this week. We've had, I think, about four days straight of rain following a, a period of drought. So we're going to take a look at at least some of the effects of that, of the rain. Um, hasn't really been flooding here yet, but it might before it's over. This is, uh, it's still raining outside today. This is Wednesday. It started Saturday night. So let's go over to Buttermilk Falls. This is a picture I took, oh gosh, last night or this morning. I can't remember which because I took photos both times. So we're going to look at a video from yesterday late afternoon at Buttermilk Falls. So coming right up here, Buttermilk Falls, coming right up. So that's what it looked like yesterday after uh, three days of rain. Now we're going to look at it, what it was like uh, this morning around 10, 15 or so. Back to there. Coming right up here to get the right, make sure I get the right one here. Yeah, that's today's. Coming right up. So that's what Buttermilk Falls is supposed to look like. We had a lot of visitors this uh, 
this month who were saying, gee, where is the water? Now this isn't, um, picture wasn't taken this year, it was actually taken almost exactly a year ago. And oftentimes Buttermilk Falls doesn't have much water on it because it's a very small watershed. So it responds to the weather. So if you have a period of relative drought, it dries up almost. And then if you get some heavy rain, well then maybe you get more like this. Um, but uh, yeah, people were complaining. So we've got our water back. But uh, in um, really wet times, and I'm not rolling that out for this week yet either, you could even get things like this. Obviously flooding. The trail would be closed in conditions like this, the Gorge Trail, because of the the uh, water jumping right over the trail up in the gorge would uh, would make it dangerous. In fact, um, at least one person has, has no, two people have died in this kind of water um, on the trail. Okay, so now we're going to go over to Watkins Glen State Park. I was over there yesterday taking some video in the rain with an umbrella over my camera. And uh, I'll show you at least a little bit of that. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some other things in uh, Watkins Glen. So here we are in Ithaca uh, is on the right. If you don't uh, live around here, say you live in France or Fort Collins, Colorado, or someplace like that, Tucson, you may not know the, uh, the lay of the land here. So we're in the Finger Lakes and Ithaca is the south end of Cayuga Lake and Watkins Glen the south end of Seneca Lake, the two longest, largest Finger Lakes. But we're going to Watkins Glen State Park, zooming in down there. Right in the middle of the picture is the gorge of the park, zooming in a little closer. Now you can see the, the crease of the gorge coming from the lower left to the middle of the picture, and that is the park. And let's see, where are we going to go? We're going we're gonna to go right down. You see where the park ends right in the village there? We did this last week, too. Um, this is the view of the main entrance, which has been completely renovated in the last couple of years. Just open, had a grand opening last month of the um, the new entrance, so it's pretty nice. And a lot of information there about the park and, and nice areas. So we're gonna go to the end of that, actually the end, which would be the nearer end, the lower left, just out of the picture, of that entrance of, to the gorge. And this is what it looks like. You're looking at a um, little waterfall, it comes out from under a bridge that's called Entrance Cascade. It has been called that since the 1800s. And it um, pours out from under that bridge. That's is, this is the only waterfall that you can get to uh, year-round. And the only waterfall that is completely, ex well, as access accessible as you can get uh, for a, by a wheelchair, say. And the rest of the gorge has a, um, you know, a trail with a lot of steps in it, although there is a, a bridge, um, which we'll see in a moment, that actually people can get to... Um, who have mobility limitations. So um, here's another picture of it, looking at entrance cascade that comes out of this almost a hidden portal in the end of the gorge. You almost can't tell that it's there. Well, yesterday I had a little water in it, so it looked more like this. So let's bring this to life with our next little video clip. Coming right up here. Entrance Cascade. So that's what it was yesterday around 3 o'clock or so, so it might be a lot more now. Uh, it might really be gushing. I don't really know what's going on there today. 
uh, or even by the end of the day. But um, there were a lot of people in the gorge. I was down in the upper gorge, down in the upper gorge, um, and d taking some video, which you'll eventually see. Um, but uh, I feel bad for the people whose camping vacation was this week. Oh my gosh, they're all soaking wet. But that's true all up and down the East Coast, I guess. We're going to look at another video that I've been working on. Uh, I've been successfully uh, making video segments going up the gorge. And we're going to go to the last segment of the gorge. I'm only half done with that video about it. Called Glen Facility. That's what they called it back in the, in the old days. Back in the 1800s, before it was a state park in the late 1800s. Glen Facility because... Though much of the glen is steep and has waterfalls and cliffs and so forth, the, the, the last third of the glen, beyond what's called Mile Point Bridge, is relatively gentle, except for the steps at the end of it, which you'll see maybe next time. In any case, let's go to Glen Facility and um, uh, do a little reflection. Coming right up, Glen Facility. final third of the gorge trail, called Glen Facility, probably because it is mostly level and easy. Trails on each side of the bridge lead to trails on the rims of the gorge. Ahead, there are no more dramatic waterfalls, tunnels, and towering cliffs. Instead, this is a quiet, reflective section of the stream. Go around a bend and you will be alone with the soothing sound of the water and the stillness of the trees. This last section of the trail is a good place to stroll and look at rock ledges, wildflowers and ferns along the way. A belted kingfisher might swish down the gorge with its rattling call and light on a branch over the stream. To be continued. You'll learn more about some of the other birds and so forth and what this final section of Watkins Glen in the gorge itself looks like. So. We look at some other pictures of Watkins Glen. We'll get some historical ones. Uh, here's a picture that uh, actually the next few are ones that were um, given me by uh, my friend Bill Hecht, who scans a lot of historical pictures. And this shows the development that was right around the gorge back in the 1800s, from about 18 from the 1860s until oh 1902 or so. And on the right is a uh, something called the Swiss Chalet. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, it had a dining room, it had a gift shop, it had a kitchen and so forth. And on the left is a hotel, the Glen Mountain House. And uh, there's a whole bunch of history of how those buildings evolved during that time. And in between the back is a bridge, is a footbridge. Looks like it's covered in that picture. Sometimes it was covered. But here is a, um, it looks like there was a cover on this one maybe that they have off. I don't know. Here's a historic picture, obviously. This is a, um, what they call a stereograph, one half of a stereo picture, that two pictures taken right next to each other can be put in a viewer and you have a 3D image. And uh, there were a lot of those made back then. So this is one side of it showing the suspension bridge. And look at the ironwork there. That's, uh, <coughs> it was built I think about 1872. And that's the original ironwork, it's still there. Here's a Courier and Ives print showing from in the gorge of those two structures and the suspension bridge that I was talking about back in those golden days of um, the private resort known as Watkins Glen. And here it is these days, the suspension bridge. Same ironwork, of course the boards have been replaced I'm sure a number of times, but you can walk over that but there no longer are any um, buildings on either side. They're, they're all gone. They were gone before the state park was created I believe. So um, we're going to go to another section of the gorge farther up in <coughs> excuse me in what's called uh frowning cliff area and used to be called back then glen arcadia and uh, look at a waterfall that is called pluto falls 
Now notice how the trail was very rickety um, uh, wooden railings and so forth, uh, limbs that were nailed together, and a log that was had steps cut out of it. And uh, there were a lot of different structures like this that didn't last very long. So this is called Pluto Falls, a very narrow little slot through the rock there. It's very pretty. Here it is today. Now we, of course, have the stone trail on the right that uh, you don't have to cross the over the falls like you did back more than 100 years ago. And um, it's pretty nice. And you get uh, This is a closer view of it without all the other stuff in the way. And it's a lovely waterfall, Pluto Falls. Called Pluto Falls, not because it was named after the Disney dog or after the uh, once what was thought to be a planet, but after the Greek god, no, the Roman god of the underworld in this dark place that uh, doesn't get much sun. So it's sort of like the cavernous underworld of Roman beliefs. So Pluto Falls. Let's see what else we got coming up here. So we're gonna we're gonna look at another historic photograph and compare it with the present of another section. This one has actually been was labeled matchless scene, looking at uh, a bridge which is now a stone bridge, this wooden bridge, and above that is uh, upstream from that is the Glen of Pools, a series of pools that drop from one to the other. So here is a modern picture of it, and you can see how those pools drop from one to another. A very charming spot. And just above, upstream from that is uh, Rainbow Falls, which we talked about in, uh, in uh, maybe last week, um, the last program, 198 perhaps. So let's see. We're gonna uh, we're gonna um, change gears here and go to another subject and to another park. And uh, by the way, this is Walk in the Park, public access television, channel 13, Ithaca, New York. You can see our whole cable cast schedule and all of our episodes up online. Walkinthepark.tv at my website. Walkinthepark.tv, my website. So uh, we're going to, I don't want to say, a couple of weeks ago was Invasive Species Awareness Week. So there are activities going on all over New York State, in, particularly in parks, to help people learn more about invasive plants and animals that are wreaking havoc on our environment. And they also wreak havoc on our agriculture and they wreak havoc on our public health and lots of different things. One of the ones that's uh, starting going to be in our face very soon is this tiny little bug called the emerald ash borer. Now that's emerald because it has that pretty um, green, iridescent green back on it. But uh, I haven't actually seen one of these yet, but I probably will because they're coming our way. The, it, the beetle is not the problem. It's, it's larva which bur burrows through the um, growth layer under the bark of ash trees, all different kinds of ash trees. I think I read there's something like 16 different species of ash trees. And um, this thing comes from Asia, and it has a, it has a, it has a um, appetite for all of those trees. And, and we're, uh, ash, particularly white ash, is one of the most common trees in New York State, so we're going to lose a lot. Here's... Here um, is a um, inside, this was at a table that uh, you'll see in a moment, um, where there were people um, on the way to the swimming area at Buttermilk Fall, I mean at Robert H. Freeman State Park, showing different things about um, invasive species and different examples of them. And in those two vials actually are uh, this and this. And uh, then that bark is the bark from an ash tree that shows the galleries, that shows the roots that the uh, um, R-O-U-T-E-S, I'm saying, um, of the uh, larva as it eats its way through the growth layer, leaving those marks on the bark. And so that kills the tree. That kills the tree, sorry. It kills our ash trees, the white ash tree in um, an old growth forest in Trumansburg called Smith Woods. Took this picture last year. And here are the leaves of the uh, white ash. It's a, what they call a pinnately compound leaf that has um, opposite uh, leaflets on it. Anyway, this is a range of the white ash. This is Fraxinus americana, I think it is. Um, there's green ash, there's black ash, and there's a number of other species that uh, are tasty to this bug. And look at the range of it, and, it, and it's imperiled in all of those places. We're going to lose virtually all of it. We might be able to save some of it. There are some 
There is some work with um, uh, some biocontrol species, but probably not this generation of ashes. Future generations of ashes may benefit from that. So uh, it's going to be a huge problem because lots of people have ash trees in their property. They've often been planted as street trees and uh, it's going to be very expensive. Plus, we're going to remove an, an economically important um, tree. It's used a lot in, in tools and baseball bats and a variety of other uh, products from the really excellent wood. And it's also an important tree ecologically. It's something, I, something like 7% of their forest is ash. I have to look that up to be sure. But uh, So we're, gonna, we're going to uh, now go to, uh, to Robert H. Treeman State Park and we're going to watch a little video where I was, let's see, when was I there? I think it was like on the 11th or something. Bring it right up here. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I don't know exactly when. I think it was, yeah, it was a couple weeks ago. I was there and um, talking to interns, talking to uh, what they call forces, park people that... Um, that are working to control invasive species in our park. So they're going to talk about a couple of them. This woman, Adriana, is going to tell us some some things. So let's go, let's go um, talk to her. Bring that one up. Yes, the last video clip here. Coming right up. I'm Adriana. I'm also a member of the Forces Stewardship Corps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is there something in particular you want to focus on with uh, today that you're doing with people that are here at the park? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm introducing people to an invasive species that's maybe not as visible as a lot of the plants. Um, it's a worm known as the jumping worm. Oh yeah. Um, so all. All worms uh, in this area are non-native invasive species. Mm, um, even earthworms. Even earthworms, huh? Yeah, yeah. All earthworms. Um, which is funny because I feel like a lot of us learn growing up that they're great for the ecosystem because they are decomposers. They break down leaf litter. But actually, we're having a problem with them now because that creates a disturbance. Um, because around here, because there are no native worms, uh, the leaf litter breaks down much more slowly, naturally, and once you introduce those worms, they break it down much more quickly, and then the plants don't get nutrients uh, as slow as they normally would. It creates like a surplus very quickly. Hmm. Um, so here's one of the worms. They're called jumping worms because they move pretty crazy. So jumping, wor jumping worms are basically what people have been calling earthworms all along, or no? Yeah, so actually these are fairly new. Uh, oh. The species of worms around here people might refer to as earthworms might be referring to several species of worms oh. because there are a few that have been introduced to this area um, these are larger than a lot of worms you might see they're pretty distinctive because they have uh, what's called well what's called the clitellum right here mm -hmm. is more pale in this species of worm oh my. it's uh, smooth as opposed to raised like it is on a lot of other species hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen pictures of uh, forest floors that are pretty bare of litter and so forth um, because of earthworm uh, decomposition of the of the litter much more rapidly than yeah. the forest is used to. And it's also tied to uh, plant invasive species because once they break down the leaf litter like that, they create a disturbance that is then taken over by species like pale swallowwort, which is a plant that we work with very closely. Um, I find that in areas where we're doing manual removals, so where we're digging it up, we also find a lot of worms. Mm. And garlic mustard is one also that would take advantage of this kind of habitat? Yeah, anything that thrives in a disturbance like that. Right, right. Yeah, swallowwort's a very scary plant to me. Do you have samples of that here? We do. Uh, we have smaller plants here. Um, you can tell them apart from a lot of other plants in the area because they are twining vines. They get about waist height. Um, they grow in very dense patches. You'll often find it twining um, on itself. Uh, it has opposite leaves. Um, right now at this point in the year it has seed pods which look like little green peppers. These samples don't have it right now. Right. Um, those are pretty numerous now. 
Um, when we're doing uh, manual removals of these, it's uh, very important to get under the plant and dig out the root crown because it respouts mm -hmm. from those if you just like pluck the plant out of the ground. Right, um, right. Yeah, I, I used to work up at Teganic and all behind the office building there in the woods is completely taken over. There's a lot of spots and a lot of areas in Teganic, but it's down in the gorge too. It's really um, distressing. Yeah, but uh, it's getting a little bit better in those areas I've seen recently. Hmm. We've been going in there and treating it and manually removing it pretty regularly. So we, you use an herbicide of some sort? We use an herbicide. Yeah. It isn't um, quite as strong as the ones used like in agriculture that kind of get a bad rep. Yeah, but right, right. We're very aware of uh, how we are applying it and how close to water we're applying it right, right, and yeah. on its effects on the ecosystem. Yeah, right, right. There's, there's the uh, careful, intelligent use of chemicals right. in particular applications and then there's uh, sort of indiscriminate broad spread <laughs> use of stuff that can cause some big problems. So. And we try to yeah. use it pretty intentionally um, in areas where it would be very hard to remove it manually or use other methods to remove it and control its spread. So that's like a, yeah, that's like a last resort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's just the scratch in the surface there. There's a lot more uh, that people were saying that day. I went to actually three different locations to it. Uh, I went at Lower Treeman. That was a table set up on the way to the swimming area. So a lot of passers-by who stopped and uh, uh, learned a little bit more about invasive species and how important they are. Um, and then at the uh, beginning of the Gorge Trail, the end of the parking lot in the upper park at Robert Treeman State Park, uh, there was another table with some very interesting people. And then finally I went to Tutelo Park, which is a um, uh, town park, town of Ithaca Park, and the town of Ithaca Conservation Board, which I used to be on, was doing a, um, a similar thing there. And so I have a lot of video of that. So I'm going to sprinkle that out through subsequent ep episodes. We're going to stay in Robert Treeman State Park for just another minute here. Actually, we don't have much time. I'm running out. But I will show you one picture here in the upper park. And um, this is in what's called uh, Devil's Kitchen in the Gorge in Upper Park. I'm, we'll uh, maybe talk about this another time. So, so anyway, um, invasive species, um, waterfalls, rain, all kinds of things going on. Thank you for joining me. We'll, uh, I encourage you to turn off this screen. And when the weather clears, go out and go for a walk in the park. Okay, thank you. Um, 